Welcome back to the 45th Annual World Series of Poker. I am here with Mr. Nolan Dalla on my quest to find more stories about Mr. Phil Ivey. Of course, Nolan has been around for a very long time, so we're pretty sure he has some good stories for us. Nolan, let's start with the beginning. When did you first encounter Phil Ivey? Well, I first met Phil Ivey in the, I'm going to say the mid to, to later 1990s. I used to go to Atlantic City, New Jersey every weekend, and the Taj Mahal was the place. That's the place in Atlantic City. That was really the place on the East Coast, that in Foxwoods. And there was this young African-American player who really stood out because essentially Atlantic City and the Taj Mahal, you had a lot of middle-aged to older white men, maybe a few women, what have you, Seven card stud was the dominant game at the time, and all of a sudden there was this young, you know, person of a different ethnicity who just simply stood out, maybe for that reason alone, but also the fact he was, well, his ID said he was 21. Let's just say that, and we, you know, he went by Jerome, and everyone knows kind of the story. But back in Atlantic City in those days, it was like, who is this kid? And a lot of people knew at that time, what is this guy going to be? And I think a lot of people knew that. You know, by the way, if, if it wouldn't have been Holden that became the game, what if it would have been seven card stud? I guarantee you Phil Ivey would have a lot more can imagine Phil Ivey having more notoriety or more gold bracelets and more you know more success in the game. But if it would have been stud, he had to convert, remind you, because stud's kind of a dead game or it's certainly a game on the decline. Imagine what would have happened because that was his that's where the money was back in the mid to late nineteen nineties with seven card stud. And Phil Ivey at the time was beating those games. And I'm talking about like two hundred, four hundred limit games some of the biggest games in the room at the time. And he's 20 years old, and most kids at, at that time are, they're making, you know, $6 an hour flipping burgers or whatever, and here he is, you know, beating the best players in the world. So he really was something special from a very early age. And you started working for the World Series when the World Series was blowing up, when it was really big. And then Ivy, of course, kind of grew with that. He became an, I an icon of the game, and you stayed around him, and you, yeah, you saw him. I'll say this, Remco. I'll say one, thing that, one more thing that you, you, you triggered was he came into the World Series of Poker in 1999, I believe, was the first year where he won a gold bracelet, and he was playing against Amarillo Slim Preston. And you want to talk about the... I don't know if you you know you've gone over this or people have told you this story, but this is you talk about really the most iconic type m match of two people, old versus new, young versus old. You know, there's a lot of components to this: old poker versus the new age of poker. Imagine Amarillo Slim, who really gave Phil Ivey no respect. He didn't even know who Phil Ivey was. And I don't want to make a racial thing out of this, but I, you know, if you want to know the true history, he called him that black kid, and it, it wasn't meant like negatively. But but Amarillo Slim tried, treated him with no respect, and maybe rightfully so, given he didn't know who this kid was. Who was 20, I think 22. I forgot Phil Ivey's age when he first won in 1999. But Phil Ivey destroyed uh, uh, Amarillo Slim, and there, there's a certain poignancy. To, to, uh, to Phil Ivey, not just winning his gold bracelet in grand style, but beating one of the old guard icons of the previous era. It's very impressive stuff. Yeah. And then, of course, Ivey turns into not only the best poker player, but also a very almost notorious gambler, <laughs> as he's known to play for high stakes in, in many different games, also on the golf course. And, and, and you said you, you maybe played, played against him, or yeah. you maybe you, you were around him when he was playing those, those big stakes golf matches? Yeah, I played golf with Phil Ivey, and I guess I could tell a couple of stories. I guess when, I'll, I'll tell a very, I'll try to keep them both short, but one of them is, uh, now, Phil Ivey and I have, let's just say, different bankrolls. He has a little more money in his bankroll than I do. But Phil Ivey, you know, wants the action, right? So we were playing on this course in, in, in uh, Summerlin, which is a part of Las Vegas on the west side of town. And we're playing, and I can't, I just don't have the, you know, my year's salary would, you know, be one hole for him. I mean, it just doesn't work, but Phil Ivey has to have the action. This is when Chip Reese was still alive. This is in 90, excuse me, 2007 or 8, I forgot what year. But Chip Reese was still alive, and we're on like the 7th or 8th T box, and I think we were betting a hundred dollars. It was something like for him, it was like a nickel. To me, it was like you know a day's pay, you know. And so you know, for me, I'm like you know, I take my putter and it's, it's shivering as I'm you know. And he's like a hundred dollars. That's like you know whatever. So you know, he's got to have more action. So we're on this 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 hole, and he says, "Wait a minute, I I got to have more action." And and it wasn't for show. It was not for show. And he just picks up the cell phone. And he picks up the phone and he says, hey, Chip, this is, uh, you know, obviously he knows it's Phil Ivey. And he says, I, I'm, this is uh, coming up, we're coming up on par four, it's a dog leg left, it's 391 days straight to the pin and down the trees on the left side, bop, 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 bop. And uh, he says, how much do you want to bet? And, you know, you hear, you, you can't hear what's going on. He says, okay, 10,000 it is. So, like, by the way, you know, Phil Ivey, like, I, oh, excuse me, the bet was he had to par the hole. 
par the hole. If he bogeys or worse, he owes Chip $10,000. So he can get in action. Chip's not there, has no clue what's going on. Sure enough, ding, 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 in the hole for he pars. As soon as that ball is in the cup, ding, ding, he got the thing. Hey, Chip, you owe me 10 grand. Here's the here's the kicker to the story. Chip Reese never says, "Let me talk to Nolan. Let me you know. Let me verify that 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 this story is true." It was a gambler's code, an honor among people in this trade that that his word was worth gold. And sure, I assume later he collected the ten grand, probably more. There were other bets as well. But that's the gambler's code. And I always thought there's very few people in the world you could make a golf bet on or any kind of bet sight unseen and not have verification. By the way, don't you remember that golf thing you and I played? Don't you, don't you remember you owe me ten grand on? Shit, I stole all my money. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one is a bit longer. You may, you know, this one. It was my favorite. So the same day that happened, uh, we were out there on the course and Phil Ivey was late. And Phil Ivey this is, of course, we had to have a caddy, and Phil Ivey brings his private caddy. Private caddy. And this kid's like 12 years old. Serious stuff. Serious stuff. He's got his own private caddy. And the kid's like, you ever, you ever see people like what I call blue bloods? These are like people with these perfect hair, and the kid just looks like he's right out of the Ivy League. He's 12, but he looks like he belongs in, like, Dartmouth or, you know, something like that. The kid just looked pristine. And you, know, you can just tell this kid's from a really good pedigree, right? So sure enough, we're talking about the seventh, eighth hole. I said, uh, guys, I'll just say his name is Steve. I forgot his name. He says, Steve, so what do you do? I'm thinking he's going to say I go to elementary school and I'm whatever. Uh, and he says, well, I live on the sixth hole. My, 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 uh, my parents, I, I live right there in this big mansion. It's right there overlooking the green. And I said, oh, interesting. What does your dad do? And I'm thinking he's a casino executive. I mean, what's the, what would you put this on, right? He's a casino executive. He says, my dad is a, is a senator. I'm like, oh, okay, a state senator, a state senator, like in the legislature in Reno. That's, sorry, Carson City, that's pretty big important. He said, no, United States senator. I'm like, what? And it, this, is, this is a, a senator named John Ensign. It was John Ensign's son. He was caddying for Phil Ivey. Now, John Ensign resigned a few years ago, but he was a United States senator, Harry Reid the other, one of two United States senators from Nevada. And I leaned over to Phil, and I said, Phil, Phil, that's when you know you've really made it, you've hit it big, when you've got the son of a United States senator caddying for you, and it's 107 degrees, you know, heat, whatever. And Phil Ivey says, no, no, Nolan, you know you've made it big when you've got the senator caddying for you. So, anyway, he's got the senator's son out there in the course, and I said, that's, that's the only kind of, you know, that's, that's a Phil Ivey story, and, and there's a million of them, and he's certainly one of a kind. And uh, here's the greatest thing of all, Remco, is, you know, what is he, 38 years old, I believe? I mean, he's not done yet. Imagine all the great stories we're going to hear the next 30 or 40 years. Goodness willing, you know. We should definitely keep this series going all throughout the World Series and also in the upcoming years because we're sure we'll find plenty more Ivy stories. Uh, stay tuned to PokerNews.com as we'll bring you many, many more throughout this entire summer.